Welcome to NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series, where we focus on how financial advisors work, live, and give to their local communities and our greater financial services industry. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Gandy, one of your co-hosts for Advisor Today's podcast um, with our wonderful co-host, uh, Suzanne Carawan. Hi, Suzanne. How are you? I'm good, Chris. How are you? Good, good, good. Um, today, we got an industry titan. And so you'll hear some something from Joey Davenport today. You know, he's, been, he's been very um, uh, you know, influential in the insurance and financial services industry. Many of you know his name. Uh, but you may not know Joey's story. So we look forward to, to hearing from Joey today. Uh, with that being said, before we get into uh, having the conversation with Joey, Suzanne, uh, who's our sponsor for today? And um, what does that look like? Yeah, so Chris, today the sponsor is NAFA's Talent Development Center and specifically the NAFA Quality Awards. The NAFA Quality Awards are now open, taking in people that are putting in their 2022 numbers into the 2023 to hopefully win that and earn that mark of distinction that will be doled out and awarded at our National Leadership Conference in December 3rd through 5th this year in Washington, DC. So NAFA Quality Awards, tdc.nafa.org forward slash NQA. And you can see all of the past award recipients that are out there currently. And you can also find them on the consumer site on financialsecurity.org. So if you go there and you look yourself up and you don't have your NQA uh, credential, you might wanna look into getting that and letting consumers know that that is the mark of quality care. So with that, Chris, back to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Suzanne. So without further ado, we, we are, we're very fortunate today to have a guy who's been meaningful in my career. Um, we've had a chance to work together, but I won't steal his thunder. So we want to welcome uh, Joey Devin. So Joey, good seeing you. Um, you don't look a day over 25, man. You, you, are, you never <laughs> age. This industry keeps you young, I swear. <laughs> oh, man. I appreciate Gando. It's good to be with uh, you and Suzanne, and uh, I'm honored that you guys would invite me, and uh, hopefully I've got something to share that can make an impact today, but good to see you, man. We go back, what, like 15 years, something like that, at least 15 I think years. So. I, I, think even, I, think, I think almost longer than that. Yeah. It's, it's, I it's been you, a long time. I knew you when you were a pup, man. I mean, you, you were like this tall. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago, right? Um, so. So, uh, Joey, uh, let's start off with, with people know you in the industry. Um, they know your they know your name. They see your face. But tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do um, in the organization that you represent and the you know the organization. Can you share with us a little Definitely. bit about that, please? Yeah, man. So I uh, I've been in the business almost thirty years. I came in the business December of nineteen ninety five. So it's kind of crazy. I. I'm going to turn 50 in August uh, and, you know, I've been in the business for 30 years. So I was hot off the college campus. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that when I started in Nashville, Tennessee. But um, today, you know, I've had a lot of different roles from advisor, leader, uh, went into the home office, Northwestern Mutual for two and a half years. So I've seen that side of the world. Join my business partner, Harry Hoopas here in Chicago, going on 20 years, uh, you know, next year, which is kind of crazy. but. Basically, um, I'm president co-founder of Hoopus Performance Network, and what we do is we're a strategic partner in the industry that provides digital learning, sales effectiveness, and leadership development tools for organizations. Like in North America, we have a huge Latin America division. We do a lot in Asia. I just got back from a two-week trip to Asia, so we're, I'm blessed to have an impact, not just domestically speaking, you know, North America, but, but all over the world and providing digital learning. Uh, sales effectiveness, leadership development today. So I'm considered, I don't like this word, but I'm considered a vendor. My my clients always laugh because at the enterprise level, I prefer to be called a strategic partner, uh, <laughs> my team, but you technically, uh, I guess, technically speaking, I'm a vendor. So, but it, I definitely have perspective from the advisor view, leadership view, home office executive, et cetera. Um, and now even on the vendor side. So, so, so Joey, I, I'm, I'm going to add some color to what you're saying though, but but I, th- I think what you didn't add to your title is coach, right? So those of you who don't know, um, I started off my career at Northwestern Mutual and um, came in, a, you know, I'll call it the draft and was sent to Chicago. And, and this so happened, Joy was my sales manager uh, at the time. 
And uh, I remember meeting with them. And uh, Joey, where are you from? I'm from Goodlettsville, Tennessee. Okay, so he's from, he's, he, yeah, he hasn't lost the accent. So I remember sitting with this guy, having a conversation, saying, what is this? What is this guy going to tell me? He's not in management. You know, he's, he's not a producer. I'm looking, you know, he's from Tennessee. You know, right? And so uh, over the years, though, you've seen, I've seen you not only grow and develop, but you were on the forefront. And I'm also going to call you a coach, but I'm also going to call you an innovator because one of the things that you guys saw early enough on is that the development across the industry needed help. So share with us why Hoopus has been so well embraced by an industry that, that they needed evolution and change. Can you share with us your thoughts? And how did you have the mindset, you and Harry had the mindset to say, let's create something that's agnostic and flat, right? Mm -hmm. Not a Northwestern Mutual. Let's create something that's unique. And how, where'd that foresight come? So that's kind of a two-pronged question. Yep. So, man, when I, first of all, when I uh, came to Chicago, my plan was to always build an outside sales training leadership development company, which was complete blasphemy to my company at the time, right? And so I was a little bit of a black sheep along the way. And I joined Hoopus as an assistant managing partner, and we formed HPN. And early on, we wanted to create, uh, for lack of better words, a consortium of experts, like the top producers, the top leaders, where we would sort of pull them together live and in person. But as we started thinking through the vision for this, this would have been, you know, 2004 or five, six, right in there, video learning started coming on the forefront very early on. Yeah, I used to deal with buffering. I used to say, hit pause and wait like five minutes and hit play. So this was the early days. And so I said, I met this technology partner at an industry conference. They said, hey, we've got this platform where if you have people with content or subject matter experts, you can film them and put them on this learning management system or content management system platform. So I said, OK, we've got a ton of content on our own. And so literally we bought a video camera and the first day I'm in my office and put it in the corner. And I had a video guy and he said, he goes, what do you want to talk about? I said, let's talk about prospecting and business development. So hit record like, hey, I'm Joey Davenport. Man, I want to talk about X, Y, Z. And long story short. We would bring in top advisors. We had about 250 advisors here in Chicago, ran one of the top firms, you know, in the U.S. So we would bring in top subject matter experts, top advisors and say, hey, you mind if we film you and if you give back to the industry or it's kind of a content marketing play, you know, for uh, subject matter experts, if you will. And they would film or we would have them in speak and film. And we started putting that on a platform and we started marketing it to our own company. Um, and then we realized there was a bigger play for that, you know, because um, not a lot of companies had digital learning at that time and it's expensive to create it. So mm -hmm. we're able to say, hey, look, you've got your producers, which is great. You need to train on your proprietary processes and products and things like that. But when it comes to sales skill training or practice management, you know, we've identified who the best of the best are and you mm -hmm. can scale up, right? Because you're able to bring in a micro learning video content from the get go. We were focused on micro learning, meaning back then it was 10 minutes, then it was seven minutes. Now it's five minutes. People are like, can you make it two minutes? Right. Yeah. But um, so we've evolved over the years. But basically, that's what happened is we had this idea creating one spot. Originally, it was going to be like kind of conference stuff live and in person, maybe audio calls. But then video technology came on the scene and we were one of the, I'd say, forefronts of filming content, right. making it available in streaming video. Of course, we've evolved a lot from there, but that's kind of the genesis of, of how HPN started back in the early days. You know, it's interesting because um, it, it truly is, I would say, in the industry currently. Now, content now, content management now is like everybody's creating it, right? So they're creating their own, but they know they made it so the platform is unique. But I would say one location. I would say in one location. You know, HPN is probably the single most dynamic platform out there for e-learning, for the life insurance business of building, growing, developing, coaching, managing a practice. Um, I haven't seen anyone yet. You know, there's pieces, right? There's segments of people have specifically of like um, infinite banking or there's something some people are like, hey, we're doing 
you know, um, uh, financial planning online, you know, there, there's just some platform, but as for how you launch it, start it, build a practice, how do you get going motivation all in one spot? You know, I've still to see any, any other, any other platform that rivals the one that you guys are on. So kudos to you for being on the forefront, being proactive and thinking that this industry needed evolution. You know, this is the industry that rides on a turtle, unfortunately. So, you know, it, 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 it needs, it needs a little spurring on and you guys were on the forefront of that. So, so, so congratulations on that, but, but you've evolved, right? And so how does now video play into the development of an advisor? How does that, how does that play in now? Man, most uh, learning and development producers are out and about, right? And so you have to have on the go learning for just in time learning. And so we have like a mobile app. Most producers are consuming content when they're driving in the car, or running on a treadmill. And so over time, making it available on a mobile device is, you know, really, really important. Um, the, the other thing I would say is from an advisor standpoint, today you need learning paths for certain advisors, certain roles, certain disciplines or whatever. But the thing I've been talking about is the YouTube of learning and development. I just got back. I mentioned from Asia, big talk in Asia. We want to create the YouTube of learning and development so that you can provide learning paths for people to follow. But if I'm a producer or if I'm an associate rep and I want to go in and type in center of influence development and it brings up every course or every video on that topic, that's just in time learning. You have to tag content. NAFA deals with these same things right on content hubs. It's important to tag that content because a producer might want just in time learning for what's on top of mind now. And so that's the big thing now is learning, curating learning paths is important. But having an open sea of content where people can easily find it by just just like you would go into YouTube and and searching in something, how I'm going to fix a cabinet or whatever it might be. It's the same thing on learning and development today. People want it where they want it, when they want it, uh, how they want it. And so we've had to kind of cater to that. That's why now we have, you know, 75,000 subscribers or learners and you know, 75 different companies or whatever. And and it's interesting. I always tell companies, like, look, you should focus on creating learning around your proprietary products and processes, but leverage an outside resource that's nimble, mm -hmm. you know, that can bring you these different perspectives from the right. industry, because a lot of times they don't have access to that unless they go to NAFA, right? Or the million dollar round table or something like that. And so we've kind of created that virtually, if you will. Hey, the one other thing, Gando, you're talking about evolving. So like last year, right after the pandemic, we had a smaller digital content competitor, financial services, education network, Dick Clary's uh, company. We acquired that company. So now not only do we have like advisor development resources and leadership, but we have about 500 videos for home office and field staff. The field staff training has become a super hot topic uh, coming out. And we also have financial wellness content mm -hmm. that's consumer facing, which is a really hot topic these days coming out of the pandemic is just the lack of financial wellness and awareness in the marketplace. So that's been a a really hot button for me and to be able to have content that can go down to the consumer level right now you're bypassing our industry and uh and we're actually going into other industries uh, because that's really industry agnostic around financial wellness for employees and things like that so that's been an evolution for us but one other thing i would tell you is luckily we had filmed this before the pandemic we had started filming building a digital practice and so yeah. we had some producers about virtual selling and how do you engage in a virtual environment and how do you build your practice virtually? And we'd film on Dave Frazier and Adam Holt and some names you might know in the business. So when the pandemic hit, we were like, uh oh, we, we can't film anybody. But we had a backlog of content on this building a digital practice. And of course, we've obviously focused on that now coming out of the pandemic. So we have an entire section around that, which is hugely important, you know. And um, at first, people were just trying to figure out get my my ring light right and you know how to balance here. And uh but really talking about how do you engage people, uh, you know, in a virtual environment and um, et cetera. So anyway, that's one way to evolve. And luckily, we were out in front of that before the pandemic hit, uh, which was a great thing. And we continue to, to focus on building a digital practice because, as you know, better than anybody. I mean, that's, you know, not going back to the, quite the way it was, you know, before the mm -hmm. pandemic. Now that advisors have tasted the fact that they can be completely efficient and, right. uh, you know, and, and and meet twice as many people virtually in a day. Um, I think that's uh, been a revolution uh, in our business. So I think seen, I was going to say, have you seen that it's also changing 
What, what's your take on what do you see about how it's changing recruiting people into the industry since we're, you know, we're officially post pandemic now. What do you see with that and kind of attracting so, them? So it's a big challenge, right? Recruiting has been down the last couple of years significantly um, in the business. And so people have to get used to um, engaging virtually and then even onboarding virtually. Now you really want to get producers into the office, you know, to have it face to face, especially newer producers that are fresh. You want to get them a taste of the culture. So the challenge is you've got veteran advisors that are hybrid or not in the office. And so whereas before you'd want to give them a taste of the culture, that's a little bit more of a challenge because not everybody's in the office and every company deals with that differently. But it does allow you to interview more people more quickly. Maybe you have initial interviews that are not face to face in person, but are virtually so that you sort of screen them out before you commit time to having them come into the office face to face. So I think it's created some efficiency from that standpoint, Suzanne, is that now we can have another step in the process, which is a quick virtual meeting after you jump through, you know, some hoops and testing or whatever it might be to determine is it even worth to have this person come into the office for a face to face meeting. So I think it's been good that way because you can cast the net a little wider, uh, maybe even have a recruiter for those managers that have a recruiter that can do that first step process so that by the time they come into the bricks and mortar office to meet with like a Chris Gandy, who does a great job on the leadership side and the production side, um, it's a lot more efficient for managers, right? Because they're only spending time with people that are that are true candidates, you know, for the firm and for the business. Joey, I, I, I'll just give you my, my kind of thoughts on, on that. Also, you, you kind of gave it some color, but if you think about the industry um, for years and years and years, we've been, we've been, we've been stuck in a box of only thinking that um, we can only work in our quote unquote local market, right? The pandemic forced us to start to realize that all the most successful people don't all live in one place. Right. And so, you know, our old school way is we get on a plane, go see a potential large client and then, you know, fly back same day or the next day and sit down and have a meeting and chop it up. Now you can, you can take that same meeting. You can do it virtually, maybe for the first meeting. I still think there's some, there's some, there's some, there's something to the yet personal interaction, right? That personal development, there's something to that. So you may still get on a plane. You just may not get on a plane two or three times, right? So you're right on the efficiency side. But it's also allowed for us to expand our horizons and get outside the nine dots. So to give you an example is it's allowed for us to go out and partner with a firm in California to bring them underneath the Midwest legacy umbrella that traditionally I would have had to go out for a week and then maybe, hey, get, get the whole team and go out and meet with that, that group for a week. But they came on 100% virtual, 100% virtual. And now there's 12 of them between California, Vegas, and Atlanta that have partnered with us and they, they, they are part of our firm and the legacy continues. So my, my, my point of that is that, is that knowledge doesn't, tra tra knowledge transcends our state boundaries, right? And so our ability to, to inspire and, and create synergy and opportunity doesn't just live in our quote unquote local market. So I think what it's yep. done is it allowed for us to kind of really expand and really expedite the growth of a firm like ours of, you know, being in the industry where, you know, there's a huge Northwestern office here, or there's a, there's a huge mass mutual office here. And, you know, there's, there's, there's Morgan Stanley and there's, you know, there's a lot of advisors kind of in one area allow for us to be able to say, Hey, look, we can go across the United States and deliver a platform that's fantastic for people to partake in and, 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 and collaborate with. But it also, Joey, one of the things you guys have done, which is interesting, is it allowed for us to say, we don't gotta go hire a trainer. We need to have somebody who can help facilitate it in house. So what's happened is we can literally, you guys have done a great job is putting together, here's week one of training for an advisor. Like they need to get on, they need to look at this and they need to look at this, they need to look at this and they need, kind of an accountability partner locally. So the idea of looking at the business versus working in the business, right? When you look at the business, our ability to use outside resources, because you know how it used to be, Joey. Hey, go down to the third floor and talk to the trainer. Hey, 
you know, the mother of development or the dad of development or the director of development. You go down and see these people and they sit in an office and you sit there and you say, I got a question about, you know, how do I process this application, right? And, sure. you know, now if you think about it, I'm not sure people are going to come back to the office the way they did in the past. So we have to we have to embrace this virtual thing. And we need to be aware that it's it's here to stay. And if you're going to be in the business, you've got to have an arm and you've got to have a you've got to have, you know, some some breath in that space. Would you agree? Totally. And again, just one more point to this, man. Back in the day, pre-pandemic, home offices wouldn't even allow you talking about cross state boundaries. They're like open to this now, even on the captive career side, like they work out deals where somebody's out in California. I mean, that was unheard of going back in 2019. So companies are open to this cross country, you know, uh, networks of coming into firms and things that alone shows you how far we've evolved since the pandemic, because that was a no, no uh, in most distribution systems, at least on the, the career or quasi career captive side. Right. So that. When a home office changes their mind so that, you know, there's some big uh, paradigm shifts going on, you know, with this whole virtual world we're living in. And, and it's so, incredible it took that long because like if you if you work at all in like I've spent a lot of time now in long term care and you get into the multi generational and Zoom, you can get all the generations of the phone together. Right. All t- like all on Zoom talking about the whole what you're going to do with the care plan. But they're all in different places. No one's all staying home in one spot anymore. So it's like finally the home office has caught up with the fact that if you just followed the network, right, of here comes all the clients that are all interconnected. It seems like it's taken, I mean, I know that it's a, you called it, Chris, it's a turtle, but it's incredible to me. I, my background's on software companies and globally. So to come into this industry and see this, it's, it's it, the transformation is incredible, but there's so much more that can be done. <laughs> Leave it at Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot more to be done. So, mm-hmm. but it, but it has so, fire in the industry, which is good. Yeah. Expediting underwriting, uh, thinking about how to u- use AI more efficiently now. Like you're reading stuff. I get this Limer newsletter that comes out twice a week, industry news you can use. It's like one of the best things I get. And constantly, man, they're talking McKinsey's study this with this. And the industry's looking at expediting these things. So, stuff that we'd still be talking 15 years from now. To your point, Chris, at a at a turtle's pace, you know, it's it yeah. sped that stuff up like ten years, which is good for us in the business. So, 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 Joey, let me just talk about AI. So, there are people now looking at our industry because our industry has evolved so slow. I remember, um, I think Amazon for a while were looking at jumping in the insurance business because of all the clients it had, because of all the people it had and access. So. Let's talk about where do you think, and again, I know you you don't have a crystal ball, but where do you think the industry is going? I'm, I'm going to ask this question. So where do you think the industry is going is one. And then I, here's the next question is the traditional career system. Do you think it will survive for the next 20 years or do you think it's going to, to, to change? And if it changes, like kind of, how do you see it? What what are your thoughts around what it will look like in the future? Because that's what we're selling for a career, right? Mm-hmm. We're at a career now. We're we're selling more of come join us, come partner with us, be a part of this. But here's my what it might look like in the future because that's how you walk forward, right? Um, yeah. But I want to get somebody who's in the digital space and virtual space who's been on the career side, you know, complete career side. And now see that the evolution is happening, like kind of just I, just, I just would love your kind of 25 cents on it. All right. You know what? I'll, I'll kind of uh, park the, the technology side. I'll come back to that in a second. Just talk about distribution. By the way, that's a loaded question. You asked me about the, dist- <laughs> what the distribution. I'm sure. like, I got to tightrope this one. But man, if you look <laughs> at what happened in Europe, like there's no career distribution system in Europe. It was decimated by regulations and things, right? That's sure, why NIF sure. is so critically important is if you get too much regulation come in, there is no career distribution um, in Europe anymore. Like Australia, forget about it. That's been gone through federal regulation like long time. So it typically goes from Europe, will go to Canada, will end up in the US. So I've been doing business now for about 13 years in Canada. I have a lot of Canadian clients, but career shops in Canada, I won't mention the names, that's been dying off for a number of years now. They have what's called MGAs in Canada which are more like 
hybrid career shops. You know what I mean? Sure, it's sure, kind of sure. good, right? It's you get independence, but then you also get learning and development and resources and things like that. So what'll happen is, and then you're going to have a consolidation that's going on up there. So there'll eventually be four or five MGAs. There's probably like 20 or 30 now. All right, let's go to the US now. Career distribution, very expensive, tough to do. There's only a handful of companies that are still able to do it you know, effectively. But what's going on in the IMO space with this, right? Well, you got a bunch of different IMOs or whatever, but there's consolidation. I won't mention names. You see it every week. Yeah. Why? Because a carrier doesn't want to deal with 50 different IMOs, right? Just like they didn't mm. want to deal with these BGAs. And so all the BGAs will roll up under an IMO. And then eventually there's only going to be a handful of IMOs, in my opinion, because a carrier didn't want to deal with those. Now, where are we at? The IMO side, they're margining themselves out of the business, right? And so the, the bottom line mm. is you eventually, if you recruit these independent producers, somebody somewhere is going to have to recruit green peas in the business. I don't care if you're on the career side, if you're an IMO, whatever, eventually you run out of baby boomers. You know what I'm saying? That you're going to be able to pull in from other companies or whatever. So even on that side of it, right, they're talking about recruiting green peas. So where it evolves is it will come full circle eventually to where we're going to have to figure out and crack the code, whether you're on the career side or whether you're on the independent side of recruiting green peas into the business and developing them. Now, uh, we've talked before, Gando, about succession planning and all this, and this isn't rocket science, but I've always, everybody talks about team selling, and yet nobody's cracked the code quite on this. And here we have an aging baby boomer population that are sitting on top advisors, 3,000 clients that they're, oh, I don't want to give up my clients, and they're hoarding them, right. even though they can't possibly meet with more than 150 of them or whatever the number would be. And then you have new people that come in the business with no market, no experience yet could be plugged into that. To me, that is chocolate meets peanut butter. You know what I'm saying? It's a perfect balance of having succession planning for veteran producers and giving people a market. The thing that's missing most of the time with recruiting green peas, and some companies do better than others of this, is giving them a market they can plug into. Well, man, we've got a market of hundreds of thousands of clients that nobody's servicing that Right. A B client to one of these advisors is an A client, right? To somebody relatively new. And so anyway, right. I don't want to get on a soapbox, but my point is. But wouldn't that make sense? Wouldn't that like radically increase the the, the probability of staying in the business too? And wouldn't, it solves two issues. It solves two issues, right? I mean, the so moment, where do the two egos go? Is that the issue? Is that the, like, <laughs> It's the one ego on the veteran producers, you know, because right. they've grown with these clients and things. And I think yeah. the mindset's changing there. The multi-line space, you guys have a lot of multi-line people in, in NAFA, right? So I'll address this. The multi-line, they're sitting on, you know, three, 4,000 multi-line agents, right? And, and just to be able to pivot and have the life insurance conversation or to have a junior rep come in and work with those multi-line clients who in most cases have no idea that the multi-line agent even sells life insurance. Think about that. It's just yeah. an awareness issue. So it's not that everybody's not thinking about these things. When you take a step back, it's sort of obvious with it. But the And then to go full circle, Gando, with your question, it's going to be interesting because even in the independent space, eventually you run out of people to poach or attract over and somebody's got to train somebody new to join the business and teach them the business, whether that's called career or independent. And that time is coming, man, over the next five to 10 years as more of these baby boomer producers are out. Now, there's innovative stuff going on, you know, with certain firms. And we see some of these young producers in the independent space and the way they're getting clients and doing like uh, a lot of it's content marketing and doing podcasts and stuff. I love the innovation that's going on over there, but we have to pay attention. And quite frankly, a lot of that's going on in the independent space because it's right. not allowed on the career side. So I think the career side needs to take a look around, right, and see what's going on with new people, it, the innovative stuff that they're doing in the independent space for business development and to build their brand and credibility. So, so Joey, um, I don't know if everybody likes chocolate and peanut butter. So, <laughs> Reese's <laughs> peanut butter cup, man. Reese's <laughs> peanut butter cup. That's the best. I, 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 I think, I think it's yet to be seen, but we do know that it looks different, right? We know it looks different than it did when I started in the business. And, and we were running our, our, our client builder meeting, you know, in, our, in a room with the chocolate. 
right? I mean, you know, it's 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 changed. It's changed so much. Um, I know that we have a our firm. We have a <clears throat> our focus. Well, you know, is to a certain amount of new people, a certain amount of what I would call people that haven't yet hit their stride, or as you talk about, got to get the airplane off the ground, right? They, mm-hmm. They've been somewhere, but they've not been appreciated or not been developed, take them from 75,000 to 750,000. Like those unique things that come after you've got the fundamentals in play that allow for you to really scale on process, product, and procedure, yep. right? And then, And then we're always looking for a like-minded individual who has the same concept or thought process that we have because we believe that collectively we're stronger than we are independently. So like, and as a team, you know, together we can each accomplish more. So thanks for that insight. I I appreciate that. Um, Truly. Um, You mentioned something that, and so Joey, I think so many times we've been in the industry so long, but I think we skip over a lot of things that a lot of people are like, oh yeah, it works so well, I'm gonna stop doing it. You mentioned a newsletter you get from Limra, right? And you get it every couple, what's happening in the industry. Um, how do you get that, Joey? I mean, is it something that, hey, I gotta pay for? What, what's, what's the story? And, and how does that association, you know, even come into the conversation about continued learning or being on top of your game and not missing some of the statistics, some of the stats that's happening in our industry, because we always have to be paying it. Yep. Man. So like on that, I don't know who gets that up. Everybody that's on here, that's a home office executive or in the home office would have access to this. It's called industry news. You can use, I get it twice a week, man. I comb through that thing. Part of what I do, you gonna appreciate this Gando. Part of what I do is see who got promoted in certain companies or who left this company to go with this company. Because then I'm going ding, ding, ding from a business development enterprise standpoint. But man, it's always has something on AI, financial wellness, all this stuff. I literally comb through it. I get it on two, Monday and uh, Thursday and look through it. But man, you know, and again, I won't mention certain names because I, I don't know what would compete with NAFA. All the great stuff. When I get NAFA things and I'm looking through there, man, when I see like statistics and data, I see how, I, how can I use that as language in the field? You know what I mean? Not just a data point or whatever. A lot of people pass right through that. Well, what is this saying about lack of knowledge in the marketplace, about people being underinsured or not saving enough money? How can I use that as language that I'm going to use out in the marketplace? So whether I'm looking at MDRT stuff or NAFA magazines, I'm always kind of looking through it as how can I use this, you know, with me, with advisors to use it with consumers or whatever. But men, other things like McKinsey. I'm like on a thing that triggers me when McKinsey has an entire insurance division, you know, and so I'm interested in post pandemic of what's going on in the industry about one expediting underwriting and things. I try to stay on top of that sort of stuff because I feel like that is a big thing that slows us down right in the business. And so there's just there's just certain things that you'd be plugged into with that, you know, whether it's McKinsey articles or whether it's um, insurancenews.net or the NAFA magazines or whatever. I try to absorb enough of that stuff and take some time each week to read the latest of it. I'm probably looking at it through a different lens than other people just because of my role now. But still, as a producer, I would be looking through saying, what are nuggets in here I can pick up on? What's data points and research stuff, you know, that's going to, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, help me for business development. Man, I go to a bunch of conferences. You know that. I was just at the the LAMP conference or whatever. Ken Dykewald spoke at that. He's like a generationalist. and and uh, you know, Suzanne, back to your point, he was showing a magazine article that had four generations from like the great grandchild to the great grandparent living in the same household or whatever with it. And he says, this is going to be going on over yep. the next 30 years in the United that's, States. That's the People trend. You're going to be living to 100 years old, healthy. And so you're going to have to do generational planning and you better make sure that you have a relationship with the children and then with the grandchildren, because that's who is going to be getting assets and things like that. But that's going to be commonplace, um, you know, where there's four generations that are possibly under one roof, um, you know, that you've got to be thinking about and doing planning for. It creates a huge opportunity, you know, for our business in a lot of ways, not only business development, just but just from a planning uh, standpoint. So anyway, I digress. But um well, and I, I wanted to touch on one thing real quickly and see if you can have some advice from some of our listeners out there, because 
you're already talking when you're talking about looking at Limra and looking at this, you're already, you're looking at it from an industry that you understand you're part of that industry. You've gone up, that's next level thinking, right? So how did you go from being a producer, looking at what do I need to do to build my own book of business to kind of thinking, Hey, I am in an industry and how do I capitalize on that, you know, long-term? Cause that's, I think a pivotal breakthrough point for a lot of producers. The ones that get to that industry level, sky's the limit. Yeah. One thing I would say on that is first of all, study groups are important. You know, Harry Hoopus, everybody thinks Harry says this for years. He goes, everybody thinks I'm a visionary because I'm just well informed. That was one of the early things I learned from him before I even met Harry Hoopus is he's been, he was in four industry study groups throughout his career, two Northwestern mutual ones. And he's still in two industry study groups, the two top industry study groups, the research agencies group that Lim sponsors has been around for 80 something years. It's like the top you know, 20 managing partners, and then the gas group, the general agent symposium. So I kind of learned from him is to be in study groups that are people in the industry, right? Because all of a sudden you go, oh, okay, that company's doing these things and this company's doing it that way. And it's good to be knowledgeable and around that. Go into industry conferences. When I go to NAFA, I have all these industry friends and things that are outside. People are doing things differently. There's cross-pollination going on because we get insulated a little bit, right? And so it's very easily to get myopic and insulated, but you got to take your, first of all, you got to get outside your own firm, right? You know, even in your company, I can't tell how many people are just in their firm that never even really go outside of their, in their own company across country to see what's going on. So for anybody that's in a study group that's cross country in the same company, that's one thing, but then getting involved with the industry and seeing what's going on out there and, um, and, and, and what other people are talking about and what's the latest trends and things. You just have to, you don't have to be a visionary. You just have to be well-informed, right? And keep your antenna up on those kind of things. But that's what networking and going to industry events and kind of taking yourself out of that. And now with me, Suzanne, I'm looking at what's McKinsey doing. Like I, you know, this is maybe a little foreign to the listeners, but I mean, I get stuff on like the Asia marketplace, you know, like what McKinsey's talking about, what's the trends going on in Southeast Asia. And, and here's one thing I want everybody to know, you all, it ain't that tough to all of a sudden have a macro view. Like if you ask me what's going on in Asia macro view, I've got it. I can tell you, right. But it's just because I've chosen to kind of pay attention to that. But as you all know, really well, it's a small industry, man. I don't care if you're in Asia, if you're here, if you're in the, what you, whatever. The industry gets pretty small pretty fast, you know, if you just sort of pay attention and you can keep a pulse on that stuff. And, and here's the last thing I'll say about it. Any other industry you go to, people are hoarding the ideas and they don't want to share any ideas with anybody else. We are in the one industry, whether you're a leader or an advisor, where the top people are standing on stage and saying, this is what I do, then here's how I do it. Now, the problem is, only about 10% of the people can go, go and do something about it afterwards. The other 90% hear all the great ideas from the top people. They go, oh, that was a good idea, man. And then they go and they don't do anything about it, which drives me crazy. But the point is, it's not like we're in an industry that's hoarding all the good ideas. I mean, I've learned so much from Chris Gandy over 15 plus years, you know, of what he's doing. I mean, he's an operator, man. And so I just, uh, you know, whether it's Gandy or, you know, whoever, whoever else it might be, it's um, you just you pay attention and you become very curious, man, and ask a lot of questions. So I don't know if I answered your question. That's maybe a roundabout way, but uh, that's how I keep a beat on it. And it's not that difficult once you start paying attention and doing some reading with it. The business gets pretty small out there. Well, I think, Joey, one of the things that you've done is you, you're open to learn. You know, I think when we stop and think about it, you know, we, we, we are all a personalities because we've been able to do this business for a period of time where you're coming to this business because you think you can win, right? You coming in, you think I'm going to rule the world. I'm going to do a bunch of different things. Right. But you're open to, and you, you've been, you, by understanding that you have to continuously learn, you mentioned some acronyms like become a sponge and you're learning every day and you're learning every week. You're taking the best of the best of the best and the, the best and then cooking this cocktail or creating this concoction that then ultimately, you know, as I, one of my mentors once told me, he goes, there are no new ideas in this world. Everything's just borrowed, repurposed, and reused. That's it. <laughs> he goes, now it's your own, right? So I would hear a saying, a lot of the sayings I heard, I, I use now come from the fact that I heard them from somebody else and I just repurposed it and added some stuff to it, right? And 
you know, and I heard we're, something else. We're, we're interpretive artists, my friend. We're just interpretive <laughs> artists. It's, it, hey, it's Frank Sinatra never wrote a song, man. He just like interpreted the songs, right? And so uh, I it's consider still, myself- It's still R&D, you, R&D, you rinse, you rinse and duplicate. That's what you exactly. do. Exactly. <laughs> I consider myself an interpretive artist for sure. <laughs> it's all well, right. I think, I, I think, you know, you, you, you said a lot. I think, thank you so much for your time, energy and effort. I just want to tap on one one other thing, though. Um, I'm looking in your rearview mirror, and I see that that hammer or the the gavel that's there, which means that that is a NAFA gavel. Um, so, share with us a little bit about what NAFA has meant to you, and that means you served in some sort of leadership role, and what why leadership, you know, um, volunteerism is super important in an industry that needs people to give back to. Yep. So, man, uh, I'm past president of NAFA Chicago and uh, Steve Holter, who is a, uh, a district agent here. And uh, when I got to Chicago, he was like, why don't you come to a committee meeting here? You come to my office. We have a committee meeting going on. I said, OK, well, next thing you know, boom, <laughs> you know, that rolls, man. It's okay. like yep. committee meeting leads to I'm on going through you know, chairman of the committee. I'm on the board. Now I'm going through the chairs. And so the point is. You got to ask somebody, right? You got to fill your shoes and, and get people involved. You know what I mean? To come in behind you. But that led to, first of all, that was one of the first times in Chicago. I mean, I know so many people in Chicago. Do you know why I know like all the leaders and a bunch of producers? Because of NAFA. I mean, that was going back to the work that I did with NAFA. And then you just take a lot of passion from it, you know, and it develops your leadership skills, whether you're a producer or a leader. And you're getting to solve problems. And, and I'll get to the advocacy in a second. But next thing you know, you look up and these are like lifelong relationships that you've built even to this day, you know, whether it's with John Nichols or uh, with you or just a, a number of people here in Chicago that I'm close with and nationally that I'm close with. Now, going on the advocacy side of it, men, they're coming. I mean, if you when we were on the Hill last year, these lawmakers have no idea what they're talking about <laughs> around finances. Man, I just right. went, I was coming back from, uh, I went to Mississippi. I had like a funeral of an aunt that passed away this last weekend. I was on a flight from Charlotte. This lady was decked out on there. She was a little bit older. She sat next to me. I go, oh, where are you coming from? She goes, I'm with the Realtors Association and I'm with our advocacy group. And we were just in DC and we did a rally last night at the yeah, whatever the uh, baseball team is there, the uh, uh, I'm going to say senators, whatever it's called, the nationals. The, the nationals. Yeah, the nationals. Man, the NAFA people are going to kill me for saying <laughs> not knowing that. I apologize. They still love the senators. So go with that. <laughs> she and I start rapping about advocacy and the importance of advocacy, and I said they don't know anything. Uh, the politicians about our business. She goes, they have no clue about real estate, right? And they just beat down this thing, you know, the deal and the mortgages that they were about to do. So she was proud they were coming back. But we got to talking about how ignorant politicians are about the issues unless we get on the Hill or NAFA on our behalf to actually educate and say, no, 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 you can't punish people that have taken their own money to create financial security for themselves because that keeps it from falling on the backs of you all. You know what I mean? The biggest financial safety net out outside of Social Security is life insurance death proceeds every year, right? Or every day. And so the point is, and I'm getting all fired up, but advocacy is everything that keeps the lights on for us to do what we do. And without us or NAFA on the Hill in their ear saying this stuff, they would make really dumb decisions that would negatively impact uh, millions of people, right? Throughout the US. I mean, the, the SECURE Act last year, right? That was huge, you know, those things. And so um, NAFA has meant a ton to me for that. Um, I know that you guys have the legislation uh, day coming up pretty soon. You know, it's always great to be up there. I mean, how many opportunities do you get to go on the Hill to meet with senators and representatives on behalf of your industry? And for those of you all that have never been and you might be nervous and I don't really know anything, you will get partnered up with people that know Gandhi and I were in meetings together, right? Mm -hmm. You'll get partnered up people know, and NAFA will equip you with talking points and things, and you're going to know a hundred times more than any politician you're sitting across from. So don't be hesitant to go. And it's an amazing experience. If you want to know what it feels like to be in the industry and at the highest level of making an impact on the industry, uh, get involved with NAFA, go to the Hill. It's just exhilarating uh, to be able to do that stuff. And 
and Gando was great last year when you and I uh, uh, got to go in with a couple of meetings together. So uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was uh, it was you and me going in there. <laughs> you 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 hit them high and I hit them low, man. And eventually they toppled. <laughs> but we hit them right. <laughs> we but we hit them. Yeah. So 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 thanks so much, Joey. I mean, we could talk to you for days, but um, you know our time is our time is limited. You are a leader in this industry. Um, you 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 you've set some some cornerstones, and you you've added value. You continue to add value. Um, so kudos to you, and thank you for all you do. Um, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you for your servant leadership. Um, you know, being a part of NAFA and leading from the front, and then uh, asking others to be part of the association. Super important. And uh, my man, hats off to you. Congratulations on your success so far. Um, when's the Joey Davenport book coming out? You know, from Tennessee. I mean, that's what I want to know. When is, when's, that, when's that coming out? Are you uh, writing that sometime soon or what? I got to find time to write a book, man. I got to slow down and, uh, and chronicle it. So we'll see. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you all having me on. It's an honor to be on here. Appreciate the work that you all are doing. Uh, the stuff you've been doing the last few years on the diversity front, Gando, and just on the leadership with it. Uh, I, I just love watching it, you know, and, and I'm a huge proponent. So appreciate you all having me on. Hopefully there's a little bit of value uh, coming out of this uh, philosophizing. Uh, absolutely. So, Joey, we got the speed round coming up. And, and, and you're right. We are on the, on the, on the precipice of a uh, congressional conference. Um, it's coming up. Suzanne can comment on the dates. If you're not signed up, make sure you go sign up. Make sure you come to the, the DEI symposium. Uh, we've got a phenomenal, a fantastic front side to Congressional Conference where we're going to highlight some of the unique approaches to the industry and what's happening to better, better equip your business to, to embrace diversity, acceptance, opportunity, and, and, and markets that, quite frankly, you may not even be in that, but ultimately you can tap into through some of the professionals that will be speaking at the, at the conference. So, Suzanne, do you have anything else before I go to Joey uh, for the speed round? No, it's time for the speed round. All right, Joey, if I had a, a graphic, it'd be like, like speed round. So the rules of the, the rules of the speed round, which is interesting, is I'm going to ask you a couple of handful of questions. Whatever comes to mind first, that's what it is. OK, so you don't have to not a deep thought process, but it's, it's quick. OK. Um, so we'll start out with something something easy. Your favorite baseball team? Favorite baseball team, the Atlanta Braves. See how easy that was, Joey? So so nothing, nothing, nothing. Not the oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubs. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking growing up. I grew up in Nashville. We didn't have a baseball team, so I grew up in Atlanta Braves. But Chicago Cubs, for sure. So Okay, got it. All right, so, so Joey, I'm going to ask you these three questions, and, and we'll, we'll get into it. So the first question is, um, you, you, you answered the one, what's your favorite food? My favorite food is mac and cheese. If you were in Chicago and you wanted to get mac and cheese at a restaurant, where would you take me? Man, I would go to a place called, uh, uh, uh Smiley Brothers, which is in Evanston, which brings it out in like a little, uh, skillet pot. And it's got the uh, gourmet mac and cheese, uh, with a little Parmesan crust thing on top. Got it. So, so Joey, if you were recruiting one of your kids into the business, what would you say to them to be, get them interested in a business like ours? Man, the only way that you're going to make more impact uh, other than being a pastor uh, or maybe being a counselor or something and, and multi-generational impact is to come into this business. So if you want to see impact on a grand scale that goes beyond your lifetime and others' lifetimes, this is the business uh, to get into. Joey, um, if you could go back in time and have dinner with any successful person, they, whether they're here past or present, um, who would it be and why? Mine would be Abraham Lincoln. So when I think about a big Abraham Lincoln fan, when I think about the stuff that he had to navigate with Civil War and just Emancipation Proclamation and just all the things coming at and just doing it you know, from what we can tell is just stoically, right? Without your head popping off. I mean, those are some heavy duty things for a leader to deal with and to be able to navigate and come through that on the other side. And and, uh, I'd want to pick the brain about how you do that without just completely stressing out and and staying cool and continue to lead people when it's a life or death 
is on the line, you know? Right. And then last question, Joey, is if you were to go back, you know, reflection is always good. If you were to go back and tell your 20 year old self, you first came on the business, what would you tell yourself about, about coming into this industry and what would you do differently? I'd say think bigger, be bolder, you know, take more risks. Uh, that's exactly what I would do. You know, even if I look back, I feel like, you know, if you say I'd done this and that or whatever, but still a victim of kind of thinking too small, you know, so just uh, kind of think big, uh, sky's the limit, be bold, take bigger risks, things like that. Awesome. Joey, thanks. We appreciate you. Um, again, I appreciate, I appreciate all you do and leading from the front. Um, guys like you are, 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 um, we need more guys like you continue to give back to the industry and care about the industry as a, as a whole. So Suzanne, do you have anything else before we close it out? May 22nd, 23rd is congressional conference and DEI symposium. And then happy birthday to you a couple of months in advance here, Joey, because that's a big one. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> big, 50, I appreciate it. Big, big, 50, big 50. Joey, do you have any closing comments before I wrap this up? No, I just would say thanks for all the work that NAFA does. Advocacy is hugely important. Appreciate the leadership of you two on here. And I'm honored to be uh, on this podcast. And uh, best of luck to both of you all. So thanks again. Thanks, Joey. All right. So everyone out there, tune into our next podcast. Thanks for being here um, at NAFA Advisor today, where we promote, uplift, and support the development of advisors. We look forward to seeing you at Congressional Conference and with wonderful people that will be there where we can create camaraderie and uh, may, may, may you move forward and, and continue to learn about the business as a whole. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, Suzanne. We'll see you guys soon. Appreciate Take care. it. Guys. Thanks for joining us for NAPA's Advisor Today podcast series. Make sure to subscribe to get future episodes. And if you're interested in coming on the show, let us know.